Okay, thanks very much. Uh, just like to start by saying a big thanks to CSO Island uh, for hosting the event and also uh, inviting ONS to be involved in this. There's been some really interesting discussion already so far. It's nice to see that there's some, some real momentum being picked up over here. Okay, I'll try and talk a bit more into the mic then. Okay. Um, yeah, so I was just saying that um, it's really nice to see that there's a bit more momentum around trying to use admin data over here as well, because so far ONS has been one of a few countries that have been really looking at trying to replace the census with admin data. And so I think it's strength in number, really, uh, around some of these ideas. So I've been at ONS for about seven years um, now then, uh, and there's been a long-standing ambition for, for us to use more admin data and try and replace the traditional census with an admin-based approach, which is also supported with surveys. As we're getting closer to the uh, next census in uh, 2021, um, we're starting to realize that just looking at census replacement in isolation is not really gonna cut it. We need to think about the wider statistical system as well, because everything that we produce from a census feeds into things like migration statistics, there's things around uh, other population projections that we're gonna make, there's also the economy, and there's also things around social surveys as well. So that's one of the main themes that we're trying to touch on today. I'll also give an update on some other outputs that we've produced in the research output space. So how we're try starting to try and operationalize some of the processes around what, what we're doing. Okay, so a quick presentation outline then. Um, I'll say a little bit around the background to how we started looking at admin data and how the focus has sort of evolved over time. Uh, I'll then say a little bit around what we're calling the conceptual framework for admin-based outputs. So this is where we've worked with uh, other colleagues at other NSIs, particularly Scandinavian countries. Um, also, I think we work with Eric uh, in the Netherlands on this. And say a little bit how we're trying to make sense of operational data and the sort of interventions we need to have in place to produce statistical outputs and statistical registers that can deliver that. I'm then going to say a little bit around what we've been able to do so far on population estimation. So size of population, we're now calling population stocks. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit around how we've got coverage errors with the data sets that we're currently using and why we think we're going to need to operationalize another coverage survey which will run alongside the admin data to produce robust statistics every year. And beyond that, I'm then going to say how, this, how it's getting quite complicated to see how migration fits in with all of this. We need a, to redesign not just for a stock-based estimate, we need to be able to produce those fl flows and components of change as well and that's where some of our more complicated thinking is, is starting to emerge now. I'll also give a quick update on um, our admin-based income statistics. So we've never been able to produce income statistics as part of a census um, before, and we've tested questions before in advance of the census in 2011, but we found that that affected the overall response rate. So um, what we're trying to do now is to see if we can augment the census with admin data to produce those kind of income outputs, which we can tabulate against traditional census topics for the first time, but also independently produce uh, income statistics in the future. Uh, and then I'll say a little bit around the, the kind of trajectory that we hope to be on between now and 2022 as we transition from a census approach um, to hopefully what will be an admin-based approach or a virtual census. Okay, so a little bit of background then. Um, so the Beyond 2011 program was the first time that we started looking at using admin data in this way. That was a three-year program between uh, 2011 and 2014. The main focus on there, uh, while there were a number of options that we were looking at, with the use of admin data, it was looking at whether we could replace the mid-year population estimates methodology and also the census population estimates. Could we do that using admin data? Uh, it was the first time that we could link together what we call our broad coverage sources, so things like tax records, GP records, bring those all together at record level, link them and try and produce estimates. Um, what we weren't able to demonstrate was what we could do in the characteristics space. So all of those more detailed statistics that a census typically provides, we weren't able to really demonstrate what we could deliver there. So we did proceed with the uh, traditional census in 2021, and there were two strands to that census transformation program. One was to deliver a census that would be predominantly online. The other was to continue this work around uh, an ONS admin data census. Um, so our goal uh, since 2014 has been to try and replicate census outputs and start to operationalize that process for producing them. Um, so we're, we're replicating as many of the outputs as we can, and these research outputs have been our focus. It's a way of uh, getting, getting things out the door, sharing them with our users, and getting some feedback on the quality of them. What we were aiming for was a parallel run in 2021, so we were hoping to deliver the online census using you know, a fairly traditional approach and similar methods to what we used in 2011 but then also run an admin data census and be able to benchmark the two together. Um, we don't think we'll be able to run that now, so we're, we're kind of 
on a, on a longer term sort of trajectory now. We think there's too many resource constraints and uh, some logistics of trying to run multiple surveys that we need to support the admin data at the same time with the census won't be achievable. So we're now looking towards 2022 when we'd hopefully make this transition to an admin-based approach. Something we're really trying to do in the short term, though, is to have an impact using admin data on migration statistics. So something we've committed to publicly at ONS is to use admin data at the core of migration statistics. So at the moment, we have something called the International Passenger Survey, quite small sample sizes that are collected from uh, migrants that are surveyed at the ports, uh, so at airports, ferry terminals, etc. Um, our goal is to try and use new data that we're acqu acquiring from the Home Office to replace that approach or, or at least be supported with the IPS um, data and then to feed that into mid-year estimates as well the following year. So that's our short-term sort of goal there. Okay, so <clears throat> underpinning everything that we're trying to design for is this idea of the conceptual framework. As I mentioned, we work with uh, other colleagues at other NSIs on this, particularly the register-based countries. Um, we're trying to adopt some of the sort of terminology we, we heard about this morning. So it's this idea of having this distinction between what is really a register and other admin sources and how these are being collected for operational purposes, how they can be combined with censuses and surveys um, to try and deliver what we really want is a statistical register, an index of statistical registers which are fully enriched and enhanced to produce uh, outputs. The kind of transformation processes that we need to develop is the complications there. So um, we need to develop you know, quite sophisticated record linkage approaches. We've done quite a lot of work on privacy preserving methods at ONS, but there's also the work that obviously uh, Paul mentioned earlier that you're doing over here at CSO. All of those kind of linkage requirements need to be to a very, very high level of quality, and we're trying to move to sort of very automated approaches as well on quite large-scale data sets. So in UK, for example, we've got data sets that are larger than 100 million records. Trying to link those to another data set with 60 million records requires some very sophisticated methods. We're also looking to influence government departments as well on how they standardise and code their data, because they don't always have the sort of definitional alignment that we need for our statistics. Uh, and then some of the more innovative areas around how we might impute for data that doesn't really get captured on admin sources. So some of the variables we need to produce census statistics for just don't really exist out there on admin sources. So how are we going to fill those gaps and also how are we going to wait and estimate for those? So that's more the kind of stuff that John was talking about earlier. Um, at ONS we're looking for, well we're looking to integrate three statistical registers primarily. Some countries look at an activity register as well on top of what we talked about this morning. But um, so we already have a business register, a statistical business register in place. Um, we also have, well, we're, we're very close to delivering what we think is a very high quality address index. So similar to the air code idea, we've got something called unique property reference number known as UPRN. That's pretty well established. We've done a bit of field testing on that recently. There'll be more of it in advance of the census in 2021. We think that's a very good frame for producing household statistics. Where we're really struggling is on the, on the person side. Um, so a, a, a person index which we're trying to develop. For us, we don't have a population register and also we don't really have the equivalent of the, the PPSN that was talked about this morning. We don't have a common identifier that's being used across government sources. So our real challenge has been trying to develop the person index and a lot of our effort is going into that at the moment. So I'll say a bit more about the, uh, the person index then. So we're trying to establish what we call a, a statistical population data set which can be used to estimate uh, population size. Uh, so we've got four broad coverage sources that we're linking together now. <clears throat> we've got the NHS patient register which has got all of the um, people that are registered with GPs currently. It does have over coverage on it because not everyone deregisters when they, when they leave their local GP. Similarly from DWP we've got the uh, customer information system. So that is a list of everyone who's ever applied for a, a national insurance number for tax and benefit purposes. Again, lots of over coverage on that source because no one's ever deregistered from that, that particular source. We've then got the um, English and Welsh school census. So this covers pupils in state schools. And we've also got data from uh, the higher education statistics agencies on current students that are registered each year. So what we're doing is linking those sources together uh, using the best methods that we can. And we have a very simple rule effectively for our for our uh, population estimates currently. We say if you appear on multiple sources, so a two of four rule, if you're on at least two of those sources, then we'll count you in the population. There's some complexity about where we count people, because sometimes you get multiple addresses that people are registered on, but we use other sources of data to, to try and estimate the most likely uh, address. Generally, this works quite well, this method. Um, about 95% of local authorities for their total population estimates 
are within 3% of the official statistics. So that's the kind of quality standard that we're working towards. About to be within 3%, um, we think is probably similar to the sort of confidence levels achieved for the, for the census output. Where things start to break down a little bit is when we look at things by, uh, at the age and sex level. So for total populations, we do quite well, but if we look at it for five-year age groups by age and sex, we can see we've got some coverage biases in the data. So most notable is the uh, working age males, where it's that over-coverage problem or the erroneous records, as John referred to them uh, this morning. So we can see that we, you know, for some age groups, we're getting near to sort of 6% over-coverage there, which all needs adjusting for. And then there's other age, age sex groups where we see under coverage. So it, for total population, this tends to net out when you get a nice population estimate, but it's not a robust way of producing um, the sort of statistics we need. These will have an impact on your population projections and things like that. So our thinking is that we, we think we'll need a coverage survey. So for the census in 2001 and 2011, we did run quite a big exercise around a coverage survey. So six weeks after the census, we do a second enumeration on about 1% of postcodes. So people get to fill in a census form uh, essentially twice, and we can make an adjustment for people that didn't respond to the census, which is about 6% we found in, in 2011. Where this gets really complicated is how you adjust for the overcoverage, and that's the sort of thing that, that John was talking about earlier. We currently don't have a method in place for adjusting for the overcoverage, and that's where the real theoretical development is needed for an admin-based census, particularly in countries that don't have this, uh, this population register in place. Here's a go, uh, an attempt at what we try to produce using the, the current census methodology. Uh, so those dashed lines are showing what we achieve in, term, in terms of um, difference from official statistics when we just use admin data on its own. If we try and simulate a coverage survey, which we've done in the past and we've tried to estimate with it, what we still have are these uh, residual overcoverage patterns here. So we get very high overestimation for, uh, for males, particularly of younger adult ages. Even when we try and trim some of those records, a bit like what John was talking about with the trim DSU, which is the bars uh, on this particular chart, we still have a residual overcoverage problem. So this is a, a massive area still for further development um, at ONS. So in terms of that coverage survey, it's going to be quite an expensive thing to run on an ongoing basis. Obviously, the census coverage survey is just once every 10 years. It's very expensive to run. But if we were to run an admin-based approach where we're trying to produce population estimates to a required level of standard every, every single year, uh, then we would need to run that coverage survey on a continuous basis. What we're looking to do is try and integrate that with some of the wider social survey transformation that we've got happening at ONS already. So the current labour force survey that we have is being redesigned for online collection. And the size of that first wave is being increased to about um, 200,000 households. What we're aiming to do is to use that, that uh, first wave of the LFS as, potentially as a coverage survey as well, because it enumerates everybody at the address. What we're hoping to do is to include a kind of coverage boost, if you like, um, so to sample from the population spine and find areas where we know we're going to have more over coverage and under coverage, a bit like a hard to count kind of index, um, and make sure that we get enough information collected on the areas where we most need it. So in terms of under coverage, we're okay. We think this will work to adjust for, for uh, people that are missing from the admin data, but it's obviously the over coverage is more complicated to design for. Um, we have explored ideas, we've done public acceptability research around something called dependent interviewing. So this was the idea of taking out administrative records into the field where you'd have a list of names that are registered on the sources and you'd ask someone, someone at that address who lives at the, uh, whether these people actually still live at the address or not. It's a bit like what we've done on electoral registration in UK, so it's this canvassing approach where you would ask people to tick off names. Um, public acceptability seemed you know, fairly okay with the idea of doing that, it was more that at ONS, we've made a lot of assurances around the new digital economy app that we would never share any data with anyone. So if you're going to an address and you're disclosing to current residents who used to live there, legally that's kind of, you're in sort of dodgy ground there. So we've had to, we don't think we're going to go down that route anymore, essentially. Which leaves us with uh, broadly two options here. We could try and find other sources of data that give you specific information about overcoverage. So, for example, if we could get <clears throat> information from commercial sector, you know, anything that can tell you that someone's definitely left address because they're no longer paying a bill there or something, or perhaps uh, their mail is no longer being delivered at that address, those sorts of things. Or it's going to be in a sort of model-based approach. So it's, it's in the sort of territory that John was referring to earlier, and potentially some of the work that New Zealand are doing as well. So that, that's our main area of weakness at the moment on the population stock side. Thinking a bit wider then, um, so everything we've looked at so far has been 
trying to replicate sensors, but that 10 yearly census has an impact in everything. So I mentioned about the migration stats earlier. I also mentioned about you know, the population projections, mortality, fertility statistics. The census that happens every 10 years sets you up to continue these uh, outputs over the next nine years before the next census rebase. Um, on the social statistics side, we use the census to effectively um, weight all of our social survey outputs as well. So the labor force survey, which I mentioned, relies on the census estimates being rolled forward. And also GDP is used for, you know, the, we need the population estimates for other economic stats. So far, what I've talked about is stock-based population estimates, but the system we currently have in place is really a combination of a stock-based estimate, which happens once every 10 years, and then a set of flows that happen for the next nine years. And this is where we see complications with an admin-based approach, where the stock-based system is happening every year. So how this currently works is that you'll have the uh, census right in the middle there, which happens once every 10 years. We use that coverage survey to produce what we call gold standard kind of population estimates. Um, so we can estimate population size at a point in time very accurately. We can produce the household statistics from that to you know, real detail in terms of um, you know, families and living arrangements. We can produce population projections and we can also provide key demographics around uh, country of birth, ethnicity, nationality. Then for the next nine years, a flows-based system takes over. So that's everything that you can see on the right there. And what we have are the components of change in the population which need to be estimated for to deliver some of those things I referred to earlier. So we currently use admin data for uh, internal migration. We look for moves on the, on the patient register. We can see who's moving from local authorities. Uh, we, can, we can look at the births, we can look at deaths. We've got good data on that. Um, and then we can use this, the international passenger service, what we currently use for the, for the um, international migration. Now these are just aggregates that are compiled and, and added or subtracted to the census estimate the year before. After nine years, what we have is the last flow is produced. So you'll have the components of change that roll over from year nine to 10, and that will differ from the new stock estimate that you produce will differ from what the census produces. So you have what we call unattributable population change. You've got this flow-based system which arrives at a point, gives you a stock at the end of it, and that's not the same as the census. So we have to calibrate that and come up with a number that you know, is acceptable to our users and makes sense and is coherent. Um, and, and our users aren't always a huge fan of that process. If we have what is effectively a rebase every year with an admin-based approach, so we've got a coverage server that's producing a new population estimate every year, there's going to be this uh, discrepancy between the flows that we generate from the right-hand side of that diagram and the rebase stock estimate every year. So it's this idea of trying to combine the flows with the stocks in a single method. Difficult to explain, but that's where, we're, um, that's where a lot of our effort is going at the moment. So what we're having to do now is try and redesign um, the statistical population data set and look at what might be the best approach for tackling both of these, the stocks and the flows. We could um, go down an approach where we continue to produce an independent stock-based estimate every year and we're just trying to portion out the components of change. So under that model, we could probably easily account for the births and the deaths because we've got good data on that and internal migration. And what we'd have left over is a, is a residual net migration figure and what we'll try and do there is work out how much immigration and emigration we want to assign based on the admin data that's available. Alternatively, on the right-hand side, we could favour a flows approach, where if we really think we're good at estimating the flows and we can get good admin data on international migration, then we could just use what is essentially a record-level model of what we do now. You know exactly who's coming onto the population data set, and you know exactly who's leaving, and then you just keep running with that flows-based approach. But the reality is that there's likely to be weaknesses on both sides and we need to come up with some kind of hybrid model which can do both at the same time. Um, I think you know, every country that hasn't got a population registry is going to end up in this sort of space. There's going to be this complexity around trying to produce your, your components of change and your stock-based estimate. We don't have the methods yet, but this is something that we've identified as something of, of, of urgent need of attention, really. And I'll just say a little bit around what we're trying to do on the on the stock side. So we're trying to move away from that two of four rule. Now this is all sort of work we're doing at the moment. So instead of saying if you appear on two sources, <clears throat> you're in the population, we're going to try and use the best information that's available for certain age groups. So for example, for naught to four year olds, we would favor for, for UK born children, we've got all the birth registrations and then we'll look to health data for, for children of migrant families. I think we should get full coverage across those two data sources. Similarly, for children of school age, we'll start with the school census as our, as our main source, and then we'll look for child benefit um, 
payments to see if we can pick up some of the missing children that aren't in state schools, for example. And we start to develop a bit of a hierarchy around that. So it's the idea of selecting which sources we think are most suitable for each age group. Uh, we don't have any results from this yet, but our, our early indications that we think it should make an improvement on those distributions that I was, I was showing a bit earlier. Um, on the flow side, um, our main focus is obviously around the migration uh, statistics. We've only just started to get access to data around travel events. Um, so travel events are really key, we think, to estimating international migration. The Home Office have, uh, have set up what's an operational program uh, called Exit Checks which effectively measures visa compliance uh, for, for my people that are migrating from outside of the EU or outside of the European economic area. Uh, we've had this data for about six months now, and we've, we've started looking at um, how we can start to compare those numbers with the official statistics. We generally think it's probably quite good at reflecting the level of migration that we have um, for outside of the EU. The challenge is working out how long someone uh, is in the country for, so we've got this, um, we get given a visa period which is assigned to the individual for how long uh, they're eligible to be in the UK for. But what we need to understand is their travel events within that, because some people will come into the country but then visit home or go to other countries in the period in between. So we need to do quite detailed analysis on how long they're actually in the country for for each separate travel event. So we're looking for arrivals and departures during that period to make sure we can produce things around short-term migration, whether it's long-term migration, and also circular migration for people that are coming in and out of the country. Uh, other data beyond um, just looking at outside of EU, we've got another Home Office data set called Semaphore, uh, which has all travel events into and outside of UK. Similar in principle, but it will be more complicated, because at the moment there are no, um, there's no visa applications tied in with that, so the, the data will be a lot more complicated to, to get down to this sort of structure that we've got with exit checks. Other things we're looking at on the migration side is what we can do with longitudinal analysis. So we've got something called the, um, the Migrant Worker Scan, which is every time someone applies to work in the UK, they have to apply for a national insurance number, and that's what's held on this Migrant Worker Scan. We've got foreign students um, on the student data set HESA, and we've also got health registrations as well. So what we're trying to do now, quite early days for us, but is to build up more of a longitudinal spine of these various data sets and see if we can compile evidence to actually observe whether someone's in the country over a certain period of time or whether this is the first time they've been here. Um, so that's um, slightly different from what we currently do on international migration, where everything's around intentions. So we do a survey and we ask people, how long do you intend to be here for? And we hope that we get accurate statistics from that, but we do know we get what we call migrant switches, people that change their plans and stay longer than they said they would. But this would be more of an observed approach. So we'd have the admin data, we'd actually look for what's, how people are actually interaction, act, interacting with the systems. Okay, I'll say a bit more around um, income then. So as I said before, we've never been able to produce any income statistics before on census, but we think there's quite a lot we can do um, with the administrative data. So far, we've just looked at directly producing estimates from what's available on admin sources. Um, last year, we produced estimates for uh, individual level for income, but also household level as well, but it was only for gross, um, gross income. Uh, and we were able to produce those at quite a small level of geography, so down to LSOA level, which is lower super output area. I guess that's kind of like a size of a parish or something like that. Um, where we are in 2018 is to try and get to net income. Some of the feedback we had is that really to make these comparable and useful for some of our stakeholders, we need to be able to provide gross income but also net income. That's what we've been able to develop um, this year. And then hopefully in 2019, we can get what we call self-assessment data. So what, what we're really missing is around uh, self-employment at the moment. That's a, that's a key component of income that we don't have. And we hopefully get down to output area level. So that's a very small level of geography. It's the smallest level we get to. Um, what we're also doing is hopefully moving into experimental statistics now. So whereas all of our other outputs have been just research outputs showing how we're operationalizing some of these ideas and how uh, we're trying to get feedback on them, we're really trying to push on the income now to get to experimental stat status and then hopefully official statistics in future. Um, lots of components of income. It's really, really complicated. Um, the main things that we're after is those data sets that are sort of on the top left side of that chart there. So these are the components which are high prevalence in the population 
and also you want them to be fully available on you know, full coverage of people that are receiving them. So we have um, employment from PAYE, so employees earnings, we get good data on that. We don't have it very granular over a weekly basis, but we have an annual amount at the moment. In future, we'll be able to get real-time information from HMRC, which will be really useful for that purpose. We have something called the National Benefits uh, Database, which compiles most of the benefits that people receive across the year. So we think we've got good quality um, data on that. As I said before, self-employment we don't have. We have some aggregate data, and we will be getting some record-level data hopefully sometime next year. But that's, that's the key ingredient that's, that's really missing there. And on the left, you can see there's a, a bunch of things that we, we currently can't provide for, but generally they're quite low level of prevalence in the population. Um, in terms of how this is put together, if I refer back to the, the statistical population data set that we're, I talked about earlier, all of these data sources are being linked to that population data set. So the, the same people that we're producing estimates for population for, that same frame is being used as the basis for the income statistics. So along that top line, we're linking the PAYE data, that's the employee earnings, uh, tax credits, single housing benefit, national benefits database, and child benefit. That's where all of the income components really come from for these statistics. And what we can do is produce these at household level as well. So I mentioned the UPRN, the unique property reference number. It's a bit like this, this air code thing that we've been talking about earlier. Uh, and we have that uh, pretty well populated on that statistical population data set now. The kinds of things we're doing is to introduce a bit more in the way of interactive maps. So we've now got an interface on the website where people can look at different, you know, look at the data differently, different cuts of data. So here's an example where we've got at local authority uh, the proportion of households that earn less than uh, 20,000, uh, sorry, individuals that earn less than 20,000. You can start to see some of the geographic patterns. And as I said before, we can break that down by gross income, net income, individual level or household level. And I think we can get down to LSOA level now on these interactives. Uh, what we've done in the past is produce um, outputs which kind of show five, five uh, well, increments of income, really. Um, what we're moving towards this year, which I haven't been able to share with you yet because they're being published uh, in a couple of weeks' time, but is deciles of income. So that's some of the feedback we had to move towards deciles to make them more comparable with other outputs that are put out there. I think one of the real advantages of this work is that we can start to tabulate income with other outputs. So for example, we started looking at ethnicity, we could start to tabulate income by ethnicity, looking at student populations as well. Um, and this is where we're, it's not just for an admin data census. In 2021, we might be able to augment uh, the traditional census with income for the first time. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is um, what we're trying to do over the next few years. And this is our kind of trajectory then for where we want to be in 2022. Um, <clears throat> Starting with the sort of components of change that we've got, so this is the, the, the flows idea. We've got births, deaths, internal migration, and international migration. Um, at the moment, where we currently use a survey, we're going to stick with that system, obviously, this year. Hoping to put a paper out over the next couple of weeks, which, which explains how we're trying to use admin data in international migration. But next year, we'll be looking to actually replace um, that component there, that international migration, with admin data. What we might try and do is to use some of the population coverage survey, that's that PCS um, testing that I talked about earlier. We're hoping to do a small test next year, which will include a migration boost. So we might try and sample areas where there's high inclusion of migrants in the sample, see if we can link that to the admin data, and see if we can check the quality of that admin data that we're using, and if necessary, make adjustments. Uh, 2020, we hope to also do the same again, but we might try and increase that population coverage survey test. We might try and get up to about 50,000 households if there is capacity. And that gives us the opportunity to also produce, um, hopefully, a fully coverage-adjusted stock-based estimate as well at national level. So we would have, hopefully, a method that deals with the over-coverage as well as the under-coverage. We can compare that with the mid-year estimates and, and see where we are for this transition after census. In 2021, we will obviously, you know, the census will take over. It's going to be a, a huge operation that we need to do, not just for the census, but the coverage survey as well. We'll still run the, the testing of the, of the coverage survey, but it won't get any more significant in size. It's only in 2022 we'd like to have that coverage survey fully up and running, so we're looking at a 350,000 household sample that we'd like to be able to be collecting on, on the population so we can make that transition. We're also thinking we need to use census data as well. So, so far we've always looked at a complete separation, so you know, effectively switch off the census and then move to an admin-based combined with survey approach. But now we're thinking we might roll on some of the census data as well to get the best of, you know, get the best of all worlds there. 
So that's a summary of where we're trying to get to. That's um, everything I was going to cover. I hope we're okay on time. Uh, any, any questions I can take at the end after Eric's perhaps? Thanks a lot, Pete. That's perfect on time. And um, we'll take questions after Eric's presentation.